In this five part lecture on constitutional choices, I'll be looking at a number of different questions that constitutional drafters have to face. I've tried to set the key questions out in this slide. I claim that constitution writers face choices first about whether to include rights in a constitution at all. Second, if rights are to be included, what rights should be featured? Thirdly, how to protect rights, and in particular, whether we want to allow what's known as weak or strong form constitutional review. Fourth, which courts should be given the power to protect constitutional rights? And the fifth question is not directly a question for constitution writers, but more a question for political scientists. Where constitution writers include these rights, where are certain parts of political or personal life are protected by the constitution, to what extent do these protections actually matter? So I'll try and give some answer to each of these questions, starting with this first big question of whether to include rights in a constitution. It's certainly true that most constitutional texts include guarantees of some human rights. Constitutions without any mention of human rights do exist, but they are particularly rare. But of course, the fact that something is common doesn't mean that it's desirable. People can do things out of fashion or trends. And so we have to ask ourselves, is it really a good idea to include uh, particular rights in a constitution? And this question relates to two broad areas of literature, two broad areas of academic writing. The first is a very particularly British debate on what's called the political constitution versus the legal constitution. The second is a debate within political theory about the relationship between constitutionalism and democracy. And although I've described these two areas as distinct, uh, there are some authors, and I mention here Richard Bellamy as one example, who contribute to both of these debates. Let's take the more general question and think about the relationship between our commitment to democracy and our belief in constitutionalism. Let's assume for the moment that we agree with the statement listed as item number one in that set of numbered bullet points, that matters of significant public debate should be decided by a majority of the people or by a majority of the representatives of the people. I take that as a statement of a commitment to a democracy. If you believe in that premise, you're committed to democracy. And if you don't believe in that premise, you're not committed to democracy. That's our first premise. Our second premise is that the rights protected by constitutional provisions are not alterable by majority vote. That again is uh, a statement that's true of most but not all constitutions. There are some constitutions which can be amended by simple majority vote, but these are rare. I take this item, number two, on our list as an example of a commitment to constitutional rights protection. If you believe in this statement, then you're committed to protecting rights through the constitution. If you don't believe in this statement, uh, then you're not committed in the same way. The problem arises when we ask whether these two positions are incompatible in some way. The incompatibility is, in a sense, empirical. It relies on certain facts about the world. 
As a matter of fact, some rights do deal with matters of significant public debate. If there are such rights, and I've given some examples below the numbered list, if there are such rights, then there are matters of significant public debate which are not alterable by majority vote. And if they're not alterable by majority vote, then that suggests that these rights are anti-democratic. This is one argument which suggests that a strong rights protection in a constitution doesn't fit with democracy. You might agree with that argument or disagree with that argument. If you disagree with that argument, you have to spell out where the argument goes wrong. And there are different possible responses. Uh, one response is to attack the empirical premise and say that uh, some rights are not in fact a matter of significant public debate, that everyone fundamentally agrees on commitments to freedom of speech and so on. Uh, now that response is in a way a little bit unsatisfying because it, it does depend on what's, what's true right now and whether some things are a matter of significant public debate. If we ask ourselves, how would we ever know if something was a, a matter of significant public debate? Well, maybe an appropriate answer to that question is gonna depend on public opinion polls or some other way of finding out what the public believes. But it seems a little bit odd that our argument for fundamental human rights should depend on very factual premises about what people believe right now. So that first response listed there is a little bit unsatisfying. A second response, a response that I associate with uh, John Elster, is to say that some rights are just preconditions for playing part in democracy. Every game has some rules. Democracy is no different. It requires certain rules or preconditions just so that we can be making sure that we're playing the game correctly. Um, we don't need to mention in our democratic constitution that you can't march people to a polling station at gunpoint and force them to vote in a particular way. It's understood that if you engage in those kinds of practices, you're breaking the rules of the game. Similarly, some would argue that certain rights, rights to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, they're just part of the rules of the game. And so it doesn't really make sense to ask whether um, these rules are anti-democratic. What it means to have a democracy is just to ensure that these rules of the game are present and observed by all the participants. That second response seems much more promising, but it doesn't seem to work for all rights. And so I think it works very well and very clearly for rights to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, what we might call classical rights, but it seems to work less well for other rights which are commonly found in more modern constitutions. For example, some constitutions include a right to housing. You might be able to argue that people can only meaningfully exercise their choice between parties or their choice in national referendums if they have some kind of stable accommodation. Only if you have a roof over your head can you then begin thinking about higher order issues about how you want the country to be governed. That's a possible argument, but it does seem slightly more controversial. That debate runs in parallel with 
a much more narrow, perhaps more parochial British debate uh, about the political constitution and the legal constitution. The political constitution is broadly the idea that we can have certain rights, but these rights are protected by the ordinary working of the constitution. That's to say, rights are protected because we have mechanisms of political accountability. And in particular, if rights are violated, then these rights violations can be raised in Parliament. Uh, relevant ministers can be asked questions about these rights violations. And in this way, we get some kind of remedy for violations of rights and prevent rights being violated in the first place. That view of rights protection is very different to a view which foregrounds the legal constitution or the idea that rights are protected by certain higher order legal norms which can be enforced by way of judicial review. In other words, if you have a particular right to something and that right is violated in some way, in particular through an action of some minister, you can bring that minister to court and force them to do differently. In that British debate, support for the political constitution, the idea that we have these rights and that they're best protected by the ordinary functioning of political institutions, that view is a minority view, but there are certain high profile supporters. One of the problems in assessing this debate is that these tags, the political constitution, the legal constitution, often play a dual role. Sometimes authors are using them to describe how the British constitution actually works. And sometimes authors are using them as normative ideals. The constitution, regardless of how it presently works, should work more in this way or more in that way. That's one problem in assessing this debate. Another problem is that when we use these tags of the political constitution or the legal constitution, we have to realize that no system in practice is ever going to conform perfectly to one of those two ideal types. There are always going to be mixes of the two elements. There are always going to be some rights that tend to be enforced by the courts, some rights which are more often just enforced through ordinary political mechanisms. And if there are these mixtures, then we have to ask whether different mixtures are stable in some sense and whether moves towards a legal constitution might supplant or undermine normal political means of resolving claims about rights. Let me give you uh, some perspective on that last issue and the idea that moves towards a legal constitution or more formal rights protection through the court, that that might crowd out elements of a political constitution. That different perspective uh, comes from an article by Alex Stonesfeet, who's talking about a, a very different context, which is constitutional review in, uh, in Kelsenian constitutional courts, a type of court we'll deal with later. Uh, Stonesfeet writes that um, where you have the option for politicians to use the law, they'll do that. And if they do that, they might be reducing other mechanisms they have for bringing up rights issues in the parliament. So what Stone Street writes is he talks about parliamentary op oppositions and their choices. He says, parliamentary oppositions could choose to defer to the wishes of the majority after losing parliamentary votes, just as the price to be paid for losing elections. Instead, seeing the opportunity to alter the majority's legislative programme, they initiate abstract review. In this way, legislators across the political spectrum have participated willingly and continuously 
in processes that reduce the scope of their own authority and discretion and to enhance that of the constitutional court. As I said, Stone Sweet's talking about very different context here. He's talking about constitutional courts and abstract review, things that I'll only describe later on in this lecture. But the general idea makes sense. Individuals litigate if the potential benefits outweigh the costs. And so for thinking just about Britain, we might have to ask, are parliamentarians themselves litigating? And if they are litigating, are they doing that because they think it's more effective than raising issues in Parliament? And so I've listed in this slide a number of cases where politicians have taken ministers to court rather than raising that issue in Parliament. You'll notice that the two cases at the bottom are perhaps more familiar to you. They are items of Brexit related legislation. And since most of the Brexit process proceeded in Parliament, these are cases where politicians had the chance to pursue some of these issues in Parliament, but where they chose to go to the courts. And so we have to ask if politicians themselves are using the courts to assert their own rights and privileges, is that perhaps a signal that that model of rights protection through the courts is ultimately very attractive? In the first part of this five part lecture, I looked at that question of whether rights should be included in a constitution. The second question a constitutional drafter has to answer is, if you're going to include rights, what rights should be included? Well, it might be helpful to think back to this topic as it was addressed in PR 1400, the first year module, Introduction to Politics and Government. In that module, we reviewed different generations of rights talked about first generation or classic rights as involving the rights to free assembly, to freedom of speech and to freedom of the person, that is to say protection against arbitrary imprisonment, uh, sometimes referred to as the, a right to habeas corpus. We talked about second generation rights or economic rights, rights to housing, work and education. And we talked about third generation rights, rights which are exercised by collectives rather than individuals. A very broad collective right to a decent standard of the environment or more specific rights to cultural self-determination or rights to language use. Rights which can only be enjoyed by specific cultural groupings or linguistic groups. That grouping of rights is fairly common and it suggests that one big factor in determining which rights are included in a constitution is simply when was it drafted? More recent constitutions are more likely to include collective rights or economic rights. But in terms of other factors which influence the incorporation of different rights protections, uh, Goderis and Versteeg have listed a couple of factors. Uh, one might be participation in international covenants. Things like uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Different commitments that countries might make, which they might subsequently incorporate into their constitution. This factor might be more important for countries which have what's known as a dualist approach to international law. A dualist approach to international law basically means that there are two separate planes. There's the international plane and the domestic plane. And in order for something on the international plane to have effect on the domestic plane, it has to be incorporated into domestic law. 
perhaps by ordinary legislation, perhaps also by constitutional amendments. So international governance might be one way that national constitutions acquire rights. There can also be regional diffusion processes. In other words, countries might learn from their neighbours. If your neighbour decides to implement a right to an adequate standard of housing for all, then maybe when you're drafting your own constitution, you think that that right is a right worth including in your own constitution. Maybe you think about that consciously, or maybe you're just mimicking what's going on, almost some kind of copy and paste exercise. And finally, there are cases where rights are present in a constitution, not through any internal factor, but through external imposition. One big category of constitutions which have been marked by external imposition are constitutions written under occupation. So the Japanese and German post-war constitutions were written under occupation and were strongly influenced by the desires of occupying powers. And so there might be different factors, some of which uh, reflect more the interests of domestic constitution drafters, some of which reflect more the interests of external actors, and some of which don't really reflect any interests at all, but are more the result of fashions and trends. In the first two parts of this lecture, I asked whether rights should be included in a constitution, and if so, which rights should be protected. If we've made that decision about which rights to protect, we can then ask, how should we protect them? And here we have a choice between weak form and strong form constitutional review. I think strong form review is typically the form of constitutional review that comes more easily to the mind. And under strong form constitutional review, court decisions are binding, they constrain policymakers, they have immediate force, the legislature can override those decisions, and it also can act so as to frustrate a clear line of jurisprudence. It can keep passing the same legislation using slightly different words whilst protesting that, oh, it's very different to the last thing that we did, which was unconstitutional and found so by the court. The most common example of strong form constitutional review, or the one that's most commonly cited, is constitutional review as passed in the US. And so uh, in the US, it wouldn't be open to the US Congress to write legislation to overturn Roe versus Wade, a decision which created a constitutional right to abortion. It's up to the court to change its jurisprudence on that issue. But that strong form constitutional review is rivaled by systems of weak form constitutional review. I've cited an article by Mark Tushnet there. Tushnet is usually regarded as the originator of the label weak form constitutional review, even if some of the mechanisms of weak form constitutional review originated earlier. So what is this uh, weak form constitutional review? Well, it's basically the opposite of some of the characteristics that we just identified uh, as being characteristics of strong form review. Um, if we think about strong form review, well, you've got court decisions which have binding character and force. That's not always the case in systems of weak form review, like the UK. I've cited here section four of the Human Rights Act. This section deals with what happens when courts decide 
that primary legislation is incompatible with a convention right. The section says that if the court is satisfied that a provision of primary legislation is incompatible with a convention right, it may make a declaration of that incompatibility. A declaration under this section, a declaration of incompatibility, does not affect the validity, continuing operation or enforcement of the provision in respect of which it is given and is not binding on the parties to the proceedings in which it is made. That means that if you take a constitutional complaint to the UK courts and the court accepts that some primary legislation is incompatible with your rights, then although you might have won your case, that decision isn't binding on anyone. No one is obliged to do something differently. Politicians might decide that they want to respond to that declaration, but they're only under a political rather than a legal obligation to do so. Similar possibilities are found in other jurisdictions. And so in New Zealand, the power of courts to make this declaration of incompatibility isn't found in primary legislation, but has been created by the courts themselves. And so the New Zealand Court of Appeal, in the case of the Attorney General versus Taylor, wrote that, we conclude that the higher courts have jurisdiction to make a declaration of incompatibility. It finds its source in the common law jurisdiction of the higher courts to answer questions of law, which extends to incompatibility between legislation and a protected right, and is confirmed in the Bill of Rights. In other words, it's just part of the job of courts to say when rights are being affected. Second element of weak form review is again the opposite of strong form reviews characteristic that the court ruling is binding on uh, the legislature because under weak form review you've got the potential for overrides. This type of weak form review is found in Canada where in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms you have a provision known as Section 33 which basically enables the national or provincial legislatures to override court decisions. It says, Parliament or the legislature of a province may expressly declare in an act of Parliament or of the legislature, as the case may be, that the act or a provision thereof shall operate notwithstanding a provision included in Section 2 or Section 7 to 15, which are the sections which deal with rights protection. An act or a provision of an act in respect of which a declaration made under this section is in effect shall have such operation as it would have but for the provision of this charter referred to in the declaration. A declaration made under subsection 1 shall cease to have effect five years after it comes into force or on such earlier date as may be specified in the declaration. In other words, if a parliament or provincial legislature wants to do something that would infringe a right found in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it can override as long as it makes that override explicit and accepts that there's a time limit on the override. Another characteristic of weak form constitutional review. A related element of weak form review uh, 
is this idea that um, ministers can act in ways which they more or less know are incompatible with how courts have decided in the past. Uh, so this element of weak form constitutional review is found in the UK and New Zealand. Uh, the relevant provision is section 19 of the Human Rights Act, which says that a minister of the Crown in charge of a bill in either House of Parliament must, before second reading of the bill, make a statement to the effect that, in his view, the provisions of the bill are compatible with the Convention rights, brackets, a statement of compatibility, or make a statement to the effect that, although he is unable to make a statement of compatibility, the government nevertheless wishes the House to proceed with the bill. Translated, governments can introduce legislation that they know is incompatible with rights as long as they do so explicitly. Declarations or statements of this form have been used in the past, used for the Local Government Act, the 2003 Communications Act and the 2012 House of Lords Reform Bill. Probably not pieces of legislation that you've heard much about, but pieces of legislation where the government said, we probably believe this infringes people's rights. If I've talked about these elements of weak form provision, the idea of legislative overrides, of course, being able to issue declarations of incompatibility, which aren't binding on the parties, statements by ministers that they think their actions are likely incompatible with particular rights. If these provisions seem odd, then you know, that's probably not unusual. They do seem odd to lots of people who come across them for the first time. But they exist because some people believe that this kind of weak form constitutional review or rights review secures a high degree of rights protection whilst avoiding judicial supremacy. That is to say, whilst avoiding a very, very strong role for the courts who become unelected elites able to dictate the scope of rights protection in a country. That argument for weak form constitutional review uh, is harder to make in the UK than it is in Canada or New Zealand. I say that because there's one core right, uh, the right to vote, which in the UK hasn't been secured for prisoners and where there's a declaration of incompatibility, which has been conspicuously ignored. Um, that's the case in the UK where successive Conservative governments um, have said that they'll look at the issue of prisoner voting um, but haven't actually reformed it in any way. So the, the UK debate is quite different to the way that the debate works in Canada or New Zealand. The UK debate is also a little bit odd because the way that human rights protection works in the UK is through the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights. And although the European Convention on Human Rights exists separately from the EU, the issue of Europe has become so politicized, thanks to Brexit, that anything with Europe in the title is treated by some MPs as a little bit suspect. Uh, and so there have been repeated calls for a British Bill of Rights, which probably would secure fewer rights less well than the existing European Convention on Human Rights. If you have some kind of rights protected in your constitution, and in particular, if those rights are protected by a form of strong form constitutional review, then you have to ask which courts review legislation for incompatibility. 
here one option is to depart from the practice of common law courts, the common law courts that I've just been discussing, the US, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, and depart from the idea of diffuse constitutional review, where it's open to any court to review constitutionality. The alternative is to have concentrated constitutional review in the form of a specialised constitutional court, a court which exists only to deal with these constitutional questions. These courts get involved either because political actors refer cases to them, typically before legislation enters into force as part of the legislative process, or because courts dealing with concrete cases refer the issue onwards. These specialised courts are sometimes called Kelsenian courts after the Austrian jurist Hans Kelsen. And Kelsen's argument for concentration was something like this. Constitutions deal with matters that are essentially political and any body which deals with political questions is likely to end up being seen as political. It's possible that if courts are seen as political, then they'll, they'll do their job poorly. They might secure lower compliance. People might be less willing to trust or accept court decisions if they think that ultimately what's behind those decisions is just politics rather than the ineluctable operation of the law. And so if you accept that premise, then allowing all courts to deal with political questions might be bad because all courts might be tarred with that brush of being somewhat political. And so that Kilsenian model has been adopted quite widely throughout Europe and beyond. Um, generally, though, it's, it's not always been practiced in a very pure form. So specialised constitutional courts haven't always retained their monopoly of constitutional interpretation. Um, ordinary uh, courts in France and Italy and also in Bulgaria have been able to, to kind of raise constitutional issues almost on the sly. Um, thanks to uh, constitutional reform in the case of, of France. Uh, other provisions elsewhere. The problem is that we we don't really know whether this Kelsenian model works on its own terms. It's it's super difficult to ask people questions about courts. Most people aren't able to distinguish between different courts. People get uh, different courts confused. Uh, in the UK, it would be very hard to get people to distinguish between the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the EU. Um, people also are a little bit shaky on, you know, what the Supreme Court is and how that's different to the House of Lords as was. So we often don't know whether constitu concentrated constitutional review works on its own terms. It is, however, a model which is, is fairly stable. Um, I've already quoted Alex Stone Sweet to you in a previous part of this lecture. Um, he talked about this kind of abstract constitutional review where legislators have the power to refer issues to a court as being a form of triadic dispute resolution, uh, where you've got government and opposition who disagree about whether something is constitutional. They can bring in a third actor, a constitutional court, to, to kind of resolve that dispute, to take a little bit of the heat out of it. If the court does its job well, then that successful referral will create a little bit of a snowball effect. And so 
political parties, when they're in government, when they're in opposition, they buy in to this model. One possible problem uh, with Kelsenian courts is that Kelsenian courts have a particular tendency to try and split the difference. And so one argument that you'll hear typically from common law lawyers is that Kelsenian courts or concentrated uh, constitutional courts, they tend not to have very clear reasoning because they want to give a little bit or they want to give some kind of concessions to both sides. They want to placate the opposition who might have referred an issue to the court at the same time as not winding up the government too much. So you do hear that criticism uh, from common law lawyers, uh, both about domestic constitutional courts and other constitutional courts or courts which have a constitutional function like the, the Court of Justice of the EU. Um, that argument might involve a certain amount of snobbishness, as I indicate there. If you've decided to include rights protection in your constitution, you presumably hope that it makes some difference. But we do, as social scientists have to ask, to what effect? What effect do these rights protections on paper have? Well, let me invite you to think about a, a particular example. The current Nepali constitution is one of the world's most recent constitutions, and it includes a general right to social justice, Article 42. Article 42, uh, gives a number of protections to different specified social groups, uh, different ethnic and sexual minorities, different castes, different tribes. So there's that constitutional right there, and it's something of a novelty. But we can ask, that constitutional right is there on paper, does it make a difference in practice? And so I turn to one recent ranking of countries according to exclusion by social group. And in that ranking, Nepal was in 74th place out of 138 ranked countries. So it was behind the UK on this measure, but ahead of India. And so the question is, did Nepal do better on that ranking than it would have done if it hadn't included Article 42 in its constitution? If it hadn't included that on paper protection of particular rights? Here is the text of Article 42, if you're interested in it. I've also listed or given a short description of where the ranking comes from so that everything's transparent. Answering this question though, about you know, whether this particular constitutional protection in Nepal made a difference is super hard though. In fact, it involves something called the fundamental problem of causal inference. That fundamental problem of causal inference is that we only get to see one world. We only get to see the world that we live in right now, where Nepal did in fact in 2015 adopt Article 42 as part of its constitution. We are not in the realm of science fiction where we can go to some other mirror universe where things are mostly the same except for one key difference. We aren't able to see both possible worlds and compare. And so in some sense, we can never really know whether Nepal in 2015 adopting that provision made a difference or not. We can try and provide good answers. We can try and provide 
reasoned bases for concluding one way or the other, but we'll never know for certain. So we can try and shift the goalposts a little bit. And instead of asking a very specific question about Nepal in 2015 and this particular article, we can ask generally, do countries which have these provisions have better records on human rights? Do countries which feature rights protection for political parties, for example, do better in practice than countries which lack that protection? Here the trick is to control for confounding factors. If we do a very simple comparison between two groups of countries, countries which have a set of constitutional provisions and countries which lack those constitutional provisions, and we see a big difference in the outcomes, well, that difference in outcome might be due to the thing we're interested in. But it might also be due to other confounding factors. Factors which affect our outcome, but which aren't related to the, the key thing we're interested in. Uh, I like to think of this by thinking about the effect of individuals making a commitment to a particular type of promise. Um, so the example I give here is people committing to saving a greater percentage of their income. You might replace that with any other kind of personal commitment you might think of, whether that's you know committing to getting up regularly and going for a run or a commitment to dieting or something like that. But if we think about that kind of example, we can start thinking about possible confounding factors. If I have a pledge that commits people to saving a certain percentage of their income, maybe some people who already have a higher income find it easier to sign up to that kind of pledge. Higher income might be a confounding factor because it's going to affect both whether people sign that pledge and how much they save. And so we might see a correlation between whether people sign that pledge and how much they save, but that correlation isn't due to the pledge itself, but it's due to the higher income that affects both pledge signing and saving. And so identifying these confounding factors is really hard. If we think about doing it for this case of rights protection, um, we have to bear that in mind. And one article which tries to do this is uh, an article by Adam Chilton and Mila Versteeg, Do Constitutional Rights Make a Difference? They're investigating the six rights that I've listed in this slide, the right to establish political parties, the right to unionize, the right to assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom of movement. They go through a, a whole bunch of countries uh, over time, and they match the information on constitutional rights up with information on how countries actually do on these rights. And so their data has three outcome levels. Either the right in practice is severely restricted, or the right in practice is moderately restricted, or the right in practice is unrestricted. People are free to enjoy that right. And the unit of analysis in their study is the country year. So they have one row in their data for you know, the UK in 2015, one row for the UK in 2014, and so on back. So they've got 180 odd countries in their sample and many more country years. In terms of the confounders that they identify, 
in their statistical model, they control for the level of democracy, the level of judicial independence, the gross domestic product per capita, or a measure of the average income in each country, the population of each country, and the presence of war, either civil war or war between states. And so you might think that each of these confounders might affect how well each country does on rights protection and also might affect how likely a particular country is to include a right in its constitution. I have to skip over the way in which they control for those confounders and I'm just going to show you the results that they find. They calculate what they refer to as a, a marginal effect on rights provision. And this shows for each of four different outcomes, the effect of the presence of a constitutional right on whether the exercise of that right is unrestricted or severely restricted. So if we take political parties as our first example, if you have a right to operate a political party in your constitution, that increases the probability that your right will be unrestricted by, let's say, five to seven percentage points. Could be as low as one or two percentage points, could be as high as nine or 10 percentage points, but the presence of that right in the constitution controlling for the other listed factors does seem to make a positive difference on whether that right in practice can be enjoyed freely. The converse of that is that it reduces the probability that the right will be severely restricted. We can go through the other rights and we see for unionization and strike and for the right to religion, these rights or rights as found in the constitution have positive effects on the right being unrestricted in practice. Sometimes these effects are very large. The presence of a right to religion in a constitution is associated with a roughly 25% probability, sorry, a roughly 25 percentage point increase in the probability that that right is unrestricted. Sometimes, however, we can't be entirely confident. If we look at the rights of assembly and association, our best guess about the effect is that this effect would be positive. But here, that black line represents our degree of uncertainty about that effect. And we can see that that black line crosses the zero line, the dotted line here. And so we can rule out that for the particular case of assembly and association, having that right in your constitution might actually worsen things. But our best guess would be that it improves the situation. I've shown you that plot for these four rights. I've missed out freedom of expression and freedom of movement. Those two rights don't appear in this plot because for those rights, the authors don't find any statistically significant effects. Why is that? Well, Chilton and Versteeg argue that commitments to rights have the potential to become self-enforcing. Some rights establish organizations that have incentives and the means to guard and protect these rights. And so a right to establish political parties creates political parties. A right to unionize creates trade unions. A right to free movement doesn't seem to create any analogous organization which has an interest in protecting free movement. And so for some of these rights, but not all, you get bodies which have incentives to police these rights and ensure that they are exercised freely.
what do we conclude on this issue? Well, I've argued that there are these five big questions that constitution writers and social scientists face about whether to include rights, what rights to include, how to protect rights, and which courts to entrust with the power to protect rights. There is some evidence that all of this matters, but for some rights rather than all rights. If you're interested in further reading on this topic, I've listed uh, a couple of articles there which might help you learn a little bit more about this broad topic.